Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's free public webinar with TPC entitled Introduction to PLC Programming. We are joined here today by Greg Sutton, one of our expert instructors on PLCs um, on the hardware and the software side. But today we're going to really focus on that software side of PLCs today about understanding that programming language a little bit. And again, this is just an hour introduction on the topic um, is kind of a, a little uh, teaser, so to speak, of what we get into in our full two days classes uh, with TPC. So uh, before we get started on today's session, uh, I'd like to let everyone know that this session is being recorded and the recording will be posted to our website within about two business days of this event. So be on the lookout for that. At that time, you'll also be able to download the PDF of this slide here, as well as um, be able to, to check out any of the classes related to this topic. And finally, uh, this is a live session right now. So that means feel free to interact with us and interact with Greg uh, on the Q&A line. So you might see on the bottom of your screen here a, a button called Q&A. Uh, be sure to click on that button and type in your question and it'll come to us and I'll be able to uh, pose those questions to Greg at the end of the session. We'll be able to answer as many of those as possible at the end of our session. Uh, there is a chat box as well. Try to avoid using the chat. I don't think we're going to be checking the chat today. We're going to focus really on the Q&A box. So just be aware of that and feel free to answer, uh, ask any questions and curiosities about the topic of PLC programming. And before I hand it over to Greg, I would like to do one more fun little activity with you all here, and I would like to launch a poll. So I'd like to ask just a couple of questions um, on our behalf to really learn about uh, a little bit more about who's here um, and what you're hoping to learn about PLCs in this webinar. So what you should see popping up on your screen is two questions. And you can go ahead and use your mouse to click on the answer that most fits you for each of these questions. The first question is, how comfortable are you with understanding PLC programming language? Are you really comfortable, very comfortable? Are you somewhat comfortable? Are you kind of neither here nor there, neutral? Or are you more uncomfortable or very uncomfortable? And you can be honest, really, this is what the, uh, learning is all about, right? And then the second question of two is, what kind of PLC or what brand of PLC are you using at your facility today? Is it Allen Bradley? Is it Siemens? Uh, is it GE or Fanuc? Is it Omron, Mitsubishi, or another brand? Or are you, maybe you're just not sure what brand of PLCs you use. All right, we got great responses coming in. And uh, we'll give you maybe just about five or 10 more seconds for the answers to come in. We got a good majority of people who are here answering the question. Looks great. Excellent, so I'm gonna end the poll now. And now I'm going to share the results with everyone here. So you should see a series of bar graphs showing up in front of you right about now. So how comfortable is everyone with PLCs? Really, um, it's kind of a what we call a normal distribution there, Greg. So basically from the kind of right in the middle of the road, people are neither comfortable nor uncomfortable. They're kind of not sure about their abilities with PLC programming. Neutral uh, at 28%, um, followed very closely at 27% of you who are somewhat uncomfortable about your knowledge about PLC programming. And that really, what we are finding that in the classroom uh, that I learned from Greg is that we really have, you know, a lot of learning that can be done about programming and a lot of uh, education that can be done. And that's where TPC hopefully can help. Uh, and then number two, uh, what kind of PLCs do you have at your facility? Far and away, number one brand uh, that people are using is Allen Bradley. That is 69% of you using uh, PLCs at, with the Allen Bradley brand, followed closely, not too closely, I guess you could say, by the Siemens brand at 34% um, of the people on the call. And then some of the other brands are, are behind that. And about 18% of you aren't sure. And that might be a fun action item after this to see what brand of PLCs uh, you have. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing those results. They should disappear from your screen, but if they don't, go ahead and just X out that little window with the poll questions, and you should see our presentation full screen, and you can see Introduction to PLC Programming. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Greg. Thank you so much for being here, Greg. Thank you, Ryan. So uh, any uh, any time we start with some basic PLC programming, uh, we want to talk about best practices. Now, uh, I know that uh, from looking at our poll results here, we have a, a wide variety of experience. We've got everybody from beginners to people that are, uh, well, they check very comfortable and everybody in between. 
So we'll start kind of like you don't know anything at all, but some of the topics we want to talk about today, uh, keep it simple. Uh, this applies to a whole lot of other things, of course, but uh, it, uh, it's especially important in, uh, in writing code. Give you a couple examples of what to do, what not to do. Uh, this is another one that's really at the top of the list as far as things that are important. Providing clear documentation. We're talking about within the program. Uh, it's also good to have you know, the, the written documents as well, but what we're really gonna concentrate here is uh, on is the, uh, is the documentation within the program, uh, explaining to people what it is, which inputs we are looking at, which outputs, that kind of thing. And another thing is consistency. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll hit on that a little bit as we go. So what I'd like to do is uh, show you what we're talking about. We're going to use a simulator program here that I'll bet some of our audience here has already seen. It's called uh, Logics Pro, and uh, it's a simulator we use a lot in the classroom along with the, uh, we, we use real, real PLCs and real software as well. And uh, if you're interested in this, I can show you, uh, after we're done here, I can show you where to get it, but it's called Logix Pro. So just to give you an overview of the interface here that we'll be using, we've, uh, when we say simulator, we're simulating over here on the left-hand side of the screen, actual PLC input and output cards. So this is an input card in slot one, and this is an output card in slot two. And then these are the real world switches and lights hooked up to these inputs and outputs. So if I close this switch, we should get an input light, an indicator light. Now that light would be the one that's on the card. So that's how this works. If we wanted to turn on this light, we'll have to write a program to do it. So let's do that. Let's start with something very, very simple and then we'll get into our main topics. But let's make sure everybody's on the same page as far as what inputs and outputs really are. So let's say we want to write a program that says, if we close this switch, we turn on this light. Well, the first thing we need to do is look at this switch. We're going to look at the input right there. So this is an input instruction. Like I said, we're starting like you don't know anything at all. Um, now, here's an input instruction that says, look at an input, right? An input is something that looks at a switch. We've got a switch hooked up to this right here, and this is going to look to see if that switch is off or on. That's what the word digital means, off or on. So it says, okay, look at an input, and if it's on, do something. Well, first of all, though, everybody sees that question mark there. That's saying, which input do you want me to look at? I have hundreds of them. Which one do you want me to look at? Well, if we want them to look at this one in this simulator program, and of course, every program is different, and uh, they're, you know, most of the time you're not dealing with simulator. In this one, though, it's simple. We pull this double zero here up, drop it on that question mark, and now we see that this instruction is looking at input in slot one, input zero. That's this one right here. So now our program says, okay, if that input comes on, we would say this instruction would become true. And then it's going to do something. It's gonna pass logic to the right. What do we wanna do? I'm gonna turn on an output. So here is an output instruction. And what we're looking at so far, even though some of you might recognize this interface looks an awful lot like some Allen Bradley software you may have seen, uh, these type of instructions are the same and the logic is same no matter what platform you have. Um, they look like this and they work the same. A little bit later when you get into timers and counters and things like that, uh, it's, it's different, but it, everything I've ever seen looks pretty much like this. Same thing over here. Hey, we've got a question mark. Which output do you want me to look at? I'm going to use output to zero and drop it there. So now we've written a program that says if this switch closes, turn on this output, which turns on that light. In order for it to work, we'll have to download it to the processor and we'll need to put the processor into run mode. And now let's close the switch and see if it works. It did. What happened was we closed the switch. It made this input instruction true, which made this output instruction true in the logic. And then that 
turned on an actual real world output, which turned on a light. So that's uh, that's as simple as it gets. If uh, if you we take it just one step further, right, to keep with the basics, if we wanted this switch and this switch to have to be closed in order to turn on an output, we would uh, we just bring another one down here, another input instruction, address it the way you want there, and then now we've written a program that says if this input and this input are both true, then turn on this output. We refer to that as an and statement. This and this have to be true. Let's download it, run it, see if it works. Okay, we see that one did not turn our light on, but if we turn on both of them, it's true. Okay, now let's do one more. This is called an and statement. Let's do an or. So for an or, we would say we want this switch or this switch to turn on this output. All right, we'll, we'll need a branch. This is a rung and this is a branch. And if we drag those in there so that they're an or statement, now one switch or the other one should do the trick. Let's try it. Okay, put it in run mode. All right, either of these should turn it on. One turns it on. Two turns it on. There we go. So that works. So those are just uh, those are just the basics. Uh, just so that uh, if you're really new to this, uh, you'll understand the rest of the things that we're talking about. That's the the real purpose of, of this. So one of our first topics is keeping it simple. So let me show you a program we use in the classroom all the time. Uh, if we uh, if I bring up a simulation uh, a garage door here, garage door. So here's our real world stuff out there in the garage door. And I'm going to open up uh, a, pro a program that we already wrote here. Uh, and it controls the garage door. So if I download this and run it, it should work. And again, we've already programmed this. I just loaded a program that has already worked, but there is one thing I want you to look at. In addition to the garage door control itself with the motors, down here we have lights, open, shut, and ajar lights. Those are here, right? Open, shut, and ajar lights. If the door shut all the way, we want the shut light to come on. If it's open all the way, we want this to come on. And that, those, that part of the program is written and it works. Now this ajar light is the one we want to concentrate on because I want to show you the difference between simple and not simple logic, even though they might both work. Here, the ajar light, it's very simple. We said if the shut light is not on and the open light is not on, then turn on the ajar light and let's see if it works. We should see this ajar light come on anytime the doors between these two limit switches over here. Let's try it push the open button and the ajar light comes on until it hits the top and it should go out and it does. So that works, right? That works and it's simple. There's really not much to that. Now, let's, uh, let's try something else. Let's use the same simulation, but this time I'm gonna open another one. And here, these programmers have done the same thing, they need uh, that they, they have the same result. Let's put it that way. Take a look at this. We're turning on the ajar light, but look at the logic they wrote to make that happen. I'll download it and run it while you guys take a look at that for a second. All right. So, okay, our open light is on. And if we close it, we should see the ajar light come on. Let's see that. Yep. And it works. So this is a great example of logic that works. But uh, I mean, look at what they've done here. They've com combined and and or statements. They, they say that if the motor is running up or it's running down and they've got another 
or around this with, and if it's not running down and it's not running up, and then throw the position of the other limit switches in there as well, uh, then turn on the jar light. Now, uh, I watched this while it was being programmed, and uh, the, the approach they took was to try something, see if it worked, try something else. That didn't work, but it was close. Then they tried something else and said, okay, well, that's not working, so let's put a Band-Aid on it. Let's make this logic work instead of backing up and punting and saying, okay, let's, let's take another look at this and try to make it simple. They ended up with Band-Aid on top of Band-Aid until they finally got it to work. And hey, the end result is that it works. And it's hard to say that's not good logic, but if you compare this to something simple, it's going to be a whole lot easier to troubleshoot if it's simple. And that's really the whole point of everything we're talking about here, keeping it simple, being able to look at somebody else's logic, understand it, look at your own if it's five or six years later, and, and figure out what you did. So that's what we're talking about. And, uh, you know, when we're just talking about simple versus uh, what I like to call convoluted logic, you may, uh, you may see the file name up there. So let's, uh, let's, Let's take a look at another, another, uh, another couple examples here. I'm going to go back to program mode. I'm going to, op I'm going to open up something different here. Here we go. All right. And this has actually quite a few, uh, quite a few examples within this logic. Let's go back to our IO simulator here. Okay. So, um, First of all, let's look at, at on the same subject of different ways to get the same thing to happen. Let's look at a couple simple ways to make this happen. Run zero. What we have here, I'm going to go ahead and download this and run it while we're talking about it. So rung zero here has one switch, switch zero. Let's see where that would be. Input one zero. That's right here. That's this switch right here. And we've written logic that says, if we close that switch, turn on red motor zero, red motor one, and red motor two. This is one way to do it. Perfectly acceptable. Let's see if it works. We're going to close that switch. And we see our three red motors are running now. Now, that's just one way of doing it. If we wanted to, we could do it like this, and this is a this is a personal preference. But there are other reasons uh, reasons to do it one way versus another. But if this was the only thing we were doing, it's a it's completely preference. You could have a separate output on every rung, and so a lot of times that's uh, that's preferable. Uh, I like to do that for, for simplicity because. We usually have a lot more control in here than what we're showing. What we're showing here, this I just made this as simple as possible. So, here on the left-hand side, on the inputs, every rung here is looking at the same input. So, when we close this switch, switch number one here, it should make all three rungs true and start all three of our yellow motors. Let's try that. And that worked. So you can see, we, it's hard to say that one of these uh, methods is better than the other one. But let's look on down here at this next one. Because if we needed to troubleshoot this, right? And that's, again, that's what this is all about. That's one big reason to keep it simple. If let's say somebody comes to us and says, our red motor one is not running, right? This one over here, our red motor isn't running. Well, we could, uh, if we had schematics, we could go about it a couple different ways. We might look in the schematics and see that red motor one is output to one. Now that has a lot of advantages. We can, we can go over here and look at the indicator light, right, itself on the car to see if, uh, if uh, you know, if that output is lit up or not. Uh, that's a great way to troubleshoot. We could also, uh, hopefully look at our logic and find it, red motor one. Well, sometimes that's hard to do because you might have a thousand rungs of code in a program, right? That's not unusual at all. So, you know, if we needed to do that though, and it was a big program, 
we could get this output. We could come up here and search for that output in here. And within, even if it was a thousand rungs of logic in a half a second, it'll show us everywhere that address occurs. If we know what it's called, we could also search for red motor one up here if we want to, it, as long as we know what it's called. And that may or may not match the schematics, but the output should, right? The output should. So that's how we would troubleshoot this. We'd say, okay, what's not, what's causing it to not come on? If there were 15 different conditions that had to be satisfying in this run of logic, right? Or this run of the logic, we could look and see which one wasn't true. And even though there are 15, maybe 20 different things would keep a motor from running or an output from coming on, we could find it very quickly. It's the one that's not true, right? It's very, very, very fast. But let's look down here. Now, when it comes to keeping things simple, uh, programmers, especially good pro programmers, really pride themselves on getting things to happen with the fewest rungs of logic. But there are ways to take that too far. Uh, let's take a look at this. Here, uh, input three zero, that's this push button right here, right? We called it clever switch on. Let's say we needed to turn on, oh, let's say uh, eight, zero, two, four, six, eight, all the way through to, uh, to 14. We needed to turn those all on with one push of the button. Well, this rung of logic down here does that, and this rung turns them off. So look at how we're doing this, though. Instead of uh, an input and an output, which is simple to understand, program, look at, troubleshoot. What we've done here is move an integer, 21,845, to a destination file of output four. So first of all, let's see if this thing works. One push the button, yep, all these outputs came on. It's pretty slick, right? It's pretty slick, but if you had to troubleshoot this uh, and somebody says output four, output four, four isn't on or isn't coming on, there's no reference to that. There's no reference to output, uh, output four, four or output four, six or anything. You could search for motor, you know, motor four. You could search for the text. You could search for the output. And output four six or four four is never referenced anywhere in this entire program. It doesn't appear there. So this is hard to deal with. Now, there's no denying this logic is effective. It's efficient. It's pretty slick, right? And it's one rung to turn it on, right? But let's look about, let's look at how they did this, right? Because um, you might actually run into it. this is uh, I've seen this done uh, more than once. So you might run into it. It's probably worth taking a look at seeing how they accomplish this. So first of all, this source, in, in order to understand what we're even talking about, about a source and the destination, uh, let's look at a data table. The data table is um, where they keep all the ones and zeros. So ones and zeros meaning on and off. So here we see that output 4, 14, right there is on. So there's the address for it. Again, output 4, 14 doesn't appear anywhere in our logic, but there it is and it's on. So what we're looking at here now is the, the binary way of looking at this word. These are all bits, bits being either on or off. Zero is off and one is on. So that's the binary word we're looking at, 16-bit word we're looking at. Now, let's look at, we could also look at the hexadecimal equivalent of that. We could look at the octal, but let's take a look at something we can understand, a real number, an integer, decimal there. Well, this is the decimal equivalent of this binary number or word here, right? So if we if we change some, this, this number will change too. 
but this 21,845 equates to every other output being on there. So what our programmer did was to take this number here, right? Now that he knew what it was, he knows that if we send this number to this entire output card here, right, it's going to turn on every other input. And he can, he could, uh, this, these 16 bits are these 16 outputs. And so he could very easily pick and choose which one he wanted to do. I just picked every other one, right? He could pick a, he could pick any combination on this whole card and with one number, he can turn on. So what he's doing is, right? He's sending this integer to a destination, which happens to be the output file that this card looks at. So you can see all of a sudden, it's not simple anymore. It's slick, it's efficient, it's clever. Uh, however, if somebody had to troubleshoot this and they didn't understand what the, what the programmer is doing here, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Uh, the output you're looking for does not appear anywhere and you can search for it all day long too. And uh, it's, it's never there. And you talk about being frustrated. Uh, that's, uh, you know, you need to get some equipment running and you can't even find what output it's connected to. That's rough, that's rough. In addition, we have to be able to turn this stuff off here. So we have an off button and we are clearing an entire word. Clear is a math instruction. We're just saying, turn them all back into zeros, right? This is a word and we're telling it to take all the bits in this word and change them back to zero. That's what a clear instruction actually does. So we can watch it work here and we can probably watch it in the data table as well. Yeah, here we go, here we go. So again, this clear instruction, if we push this off button, right, this off button here, three, one, it will send a clear, uh, clear command to move all, take, change all those to zeros. Let's see if it works. There you go. So we changed them all to zeros and that made all these go off. So it works, they're all on, they're all off. Um, however, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, somebody gets in here and they don't, they've never even seen a clear instruction before. Uh, moves are used all the time, but uh, this is just of course one way to use them. But um, uh, you can see how this might be a whole lot harder to deal with, really. So let's see here. Um, let's um, um, let's take another look, right, at uh, something a little bit further down here. Other mistakes you can make. Uh, here's one. Now this is uh, we're kind of going over do's and don'ts. Uh, this is a don't, and um, and it's uh, you know this is like okay maybe you shouldn't do this. These are, you can choose which way you want to do it, but down here, uh, this is just something you can't do. What we have here are what are referred to as duplicate output bits. We're trying to turn something on. Well, take a look here. Here's our output 214. And here's another output 214. So we might, we might want to write logic that says, if we turn this switch on, then turn on this output. Or if we turn this switch on, we want the output to come on. Well, that won't work because if you want to, if you want to keep it simple, you can think of it as a, a being overwritten. This one is overwriting uh, the bit uh, according to what we've done here. So let me show you what happens. Here, input 113. So that's all the way down here, right? Input 113. Here's this switch. Well, let's see if it works. It doesn't, does it? The program says, if 113 is true, turn on 214, and it didn't work. Well, let's, let's try the other one. Here's a program, this wrong here says, if we turn on input 114, turn on 214. Let's see if it works, 114, that's right here. It does work, it does work. Well, let's try this one. Nope, that one doesn't work at all. 
And the reason is they're both referring to output 214. And in this case, the last one wins, whether it's on or off, that last one is go going to overwrite that bit. Now that actually is something that will work differently from one processor to another one, one program to another one. But in this case, uh, it's, a, it's always a bad idea, right? That's, on, that's under the don't column. Duplicate destructive bits, we'll call it. Now, one of the ways that this can happen is, now remember, we're looking at ones that are right next to each other. One of the ways this can happen very easily is when you add something to an existing program. You've got a PLC that's been sitting there for 10 years and everything's running fine. And somebody says, well, I want to add a pump somewhere. And you go to the PLC cabinet and you look for spares and you find some spare outputs that don't even have any wire on them. So you know they're spare. They don't even have any wire on the outputs. So you know you can use them. And then you use them in your program and you find out that 10 years ago, those outputs were used, right? You, those outputs were used and they just never took them out of the program. So in that case, it's not right next to it where you can find it. It might be a couple hundred rungs down where you don't even know it's there. Uh, two ways around that. One is, right, well, the, let's just say one way, one easy way. If you're planning on using this output and it's a spare, go up here and search for it first and see if it's used anywhere in the program. That's, uh, that's the first step if you're going to use a uh, spare. Now, I want to point something else out here because this is something, uh, if you're trying to troubleshoot, makes no sense at all. When you see a switch come on, right, this one, when you see an input instruction that's true and the output isn't, uh, that's confusing. There are only a few ways that this can happen. The first one that fools everybody is you're not online with the processor, right? You're not online with the processor. And another one is you're looking at a PLC program on your laptop that is not the same one that's in, uh, that's in the PLC. But usually when you see something like this happen, usually that means you're, you're not online with the processor. You don't really see what's happening out there as far as the true state of the inputs and outputs. Uh, the other way that can happen is this right here. So this is worth remembering because uh, from a troubleshooting standpoint, uh, this is hard to deal with. It, nothing makes sense. You look and you see I'm online with the processor and this simply isn't turning this on. And, you know, I mean, it could be, you know, you could have a, a blown processor that could do this kind of thing. You could have, uh, you know, actual hardware problems that could cause this. And uh, if you go down that road, uh, you're, you're, you're in for a long day, put it that way. Okay, so let's go down a little bit further, right? And talk about documentation and consistency. So uh, actually the consistency comes into play a couple different, uh, in a couple different ways, right? Let's, uh, let's, look at, uh, let's look at it up here to begin with. First, if you're the person that's writing a program from scratch, then, hey, you can decide, do I want to turn on a bunch of outputs like this, or do I want to turn on my outputs like this and have every output on a separate run? That's your call, right? You can do it. My advice, though, is that once you pick a way, stick with it. Our goal here is to make the software easy to troubleshoot. And, and we're not really even talking about troubleshooting the software. We're talking about using the software to troubleshoot hardware. Things out there that ha have been running for a while or maybe years, and suddenly they aren't. Uh, that's when the software, the code that we're writing here needs to be easy to understand. So once somebody looks at this and figures out this is how they do it, Right. If it's five years from now, you wrote this code. If every time you turn on three motors, you put them like this, you know, then they know what they're looking at. If you switch back and forth, it gets harder. They have more to learn. So stick with that. Now, that said, if 
if you're getting, if you're modifying somebody else's logic, and you know, for, for maintenance people who might get into a, a program and make the occasional change, uh, that, that's where this is important. And it gets tough because sometimes the logic isn't as simple as a switch and an output, right? There's more to it than that. Uh, maybe somebody did this. So that's another time you want to keep, you want to remain consistent in the programming. Let's say, you know, let's say that somebody has done this, right? And this is brand new to you and you've never seen this before, right? And you need to turn on eight motors with one switch. Well, when you run into logic you don't understand, and it might be a big section of logic too, and that can happen to experienced good programmers where you're looking at somebody else's logic and you don't really understand what they're doing with it. They have their own way of doing it. It's tempting to delete it all and write it again from scratch. And, and sometimes that's necessary, you know, sometimes it's just so bad and convoluted that you really do need to delete it and start from scratch and write your own logic. It's tempting to do that when you don't understand what they've done, but it's worth the time, usually, it's worth the time to figure out what, the, what they've done and then do it like that. Duplicate what they've done. There's, there's the reason for consistency. There's, you do it because somebody looking at the program, even if it's you later, you come back two years later, you want everybody, everything to be done the same way. You don't want to have to learn a different way of doing things every rung of logic, right? So that's, that's one reason. That's one reason. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it, who comes after you? Is it going to be? Is it going to be you? It might. It really might be you. You always want to take care of the next guy because the next guy might be you. And so, um, it's. Uh, it is. It really is worth taking a look and take the time and try to figure out what they've done and then duplicate that. That way, every every unit is done the same way. If you have four air compressors, you don't have one of them that's programmed differently than all the rest. That can really cause problems down the road. So let's see here. Let's see. And another thing, uh, cutting and pasting might be a lot easier than your own uh, than you know writing your own logic from scratch too. So okay, now how about uh, how about documentation? We talked about good documentation. So when we say documentation, what we're talking about is these descriptions here, right? We have a switch, yellow motor. Now, a few things to avoid. One, uh, cryptic tags, right? Cryptic uh, documentation. What is, what is this? You need to be able to look at this logic and anybody needs to be able to look at it and figure out what it is. Guys, this is one of those things that job security, uh, there's just no such thing as job security. You might, you might be tempted to write a program that only you understand or tags that only you understand, right? Well, uh, it doesn't work. Uh, I mean, first of all, it might be you that it comes back to. Uh, two, there's no such thing as job security. If they want to get rid of you, they're going to get rid of you. And it's just the next guy that is going to make it hard on, right? That, that doesn't help you at all either. So you want to, you really want to make it so that anybody can understand it. Uh, short is good, but not cryptic. Uh, things like this, they don't, it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, here, start. Well, what am I starting? You know, you could have used start on every one of these up here, start, start, start. And it would have worked, right? The, the PLC doesn't care what, what you call it. C looks at these in most cases. So um, be descriptive. What am I starting here? What am I starting? Am I opening a valve? Am I starting a motor? What am I doing? So uh, short, now, it's, uh, it's nice to be able to look at something and know exactly what it is. 
normally close pressure switch. Uh, okay, temperature switch alarm, pressure switch behind the wall somewhere, big exhaust fan. <laughs> that's nice, but in a real program, that's too much. What happens is it, it causes uh, it, it causes these rungs to have to wrap around. They get hard to read, and it's nice. It's it's to be able to understand this, but you need to be you need it needs to be shorter than that. But um, you know, understandable. Now under under that understandable, rung comments are huge, especially in big programs. You know, I I said the you know, it's not unusual to have thousands of runs of code, but, you know, even a small machine might have hundreds, you know, hundreds of runs. So run comments like what you're doing here are really, really helpful. Uh, like this, following 10 rungs, control the air compressor number two, if it's in auto mode. And then there would be 10, 10 rungs under here that can control the air compressor. That's huge. Typically, things like this, all you have to do is right click this, uh, this rung and add a comment. That's something that's different from processor to processor, but it's, uh, it, it's, on, it's available on, on all brands. So, uh, talking about short, but not cryptic, uh, we do have standards. For example, uh, this is a standard uh, pressure switch low is what that's what that stands for and temperature switch high. Uh, these are standard designations that are used on PNIDs, schematics, programs. Uh, but I tell you what's probably more important is matching the schematic. So uh, many times this will match a schematic. It'll start out with a PNID, a, 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 a piping and instrumentation diagram. That's how a job starts when they haven't even broken ground. They're just in the design phase of it. And they say, this is how the, the piping and the instrumentation being things like, you know, pressure switches and uh, flow transmitters and things like that are all on a drawing. And they'll call it, you know, uh, pressure switch low dash one, or maybe it says unit 32 pressure switch low PSL. All right, but since they're standard, they're understandable to most people. It starts out on that PNID, then it makes its way to the, the schematics, and the schematics say the exact same thing. So it's important to be able to match this to the schematics because if you're troubleshooting, that's what you're looking at. Hopefully, you have some schematics to, to look at. So over here, though, well, this is not a standard anything, and I can't figure out what this means, right? But here's what we have done. Let's look at this. This is output 86, and we've got this cryptic looking number there. Well, let's take a look at where this, the schematics that they came from. So here is an output module, right? slot 8, and down here is output 6, we see. And output six turns on something. Well, you might have called that output IR7. And that's that's a appears to be a coil of a relay. It could be a starter coil. But if we go all the way over here, what are we actually turning on with that output? Well, here it's blower number three. Now we didn't have room in our logic to write all this. So here's what we did. This is what matches the logic. So now we've got it on our schematics and it's in the logic. And in addition to that, we've got our output over here, our output address that we can look for too. So let's go back to our logic. And, um, and there it is, yeah, there it is. So other things besides that, we wanna try to, we wanna try to wrap this up so that we can uh, we can allow some time, time for questions, uh, but other just other standard things. Uh, we want to, um, you know, do's and don'ts. Backup. It's no different than any other computer program. You need to have backups, multiple backups. Now, when I say multiple backups, I'm talking about more than one copy. So let's say you have one on the hard drive. Now, one thing to remember is, if you have one on your hard drive and the PLC is running a program, 
uh, you're in good shape. You have a you actually have a copy of the program in the PLC. Now it might not have this documentation, depending on how old your PLC is and what version of software they're using. It might only have things like this. It might only have input addresses, but the program is in there, right? So if you have it backed up, at least it'll run. Even though you might be able, you might not be able to look at it and tell what that is, uh, it's in there. Now you've got one on your laptop too. Well, what if your hard drive crashes? It's a good idea to have have another backup somewhere else. A thumb drive, uh, network drives uh, are great typically because they're backed up nightly to a server somewhere right to the cloud so a lot of manufacturing facilities do that they they uh, they have a copy a current copy uh, right there right there on the uh, on the uh, on the network drive they'll call it which is backed up nightly and then you've got a version on your on your computer too plus the one in the plc okay now we're starting to see that we have three copies now, if we update something, right, we make a change, well, we need to update all of those. So keeping track of your multiple backups is a really good idea. You want to, you want to be descriptive in there. Uh, the, the computer, whatever OS you've got is gonna time and date stamp them. That's helpful, we, we always have that. But also you wanna be descriptive about what, uh, what what you're doing or what is this copy you know especially on jobs where you're your startups and commissioning where you have daily changes and daily addition additions to something right so um that's um uh, that we probably even though we could easily talk about this kind of thing for uh for another eight hours uh, we probably ought to open it up to questions uh, let's see here. Um, bef before we do that, I did promise everybody uh, I would explain where you can get this simulation program. It's uh, it's called Logix Pro, and uh, this is where you can get it. It's a uh, it's a it's a good place to go and look at uh, very very simple things. It's a it's a you can download this for yourself, and. Um, it's a good way to get started, uh, play uh, something to play around with. Of course, um, you know, it, it's great for learning. You, you can't ask it questions and it doesn't give you answers like uh, like an instructor led uh, class would. But uh, it's a good start. It really is. It really is. So uh, we we actually use it in the classroom quite a bit. So um, I guess then we need to uh, bring it back to you, Ryan. Uh, Ryan, you have, uh, you have some questions coming in. Yes, we got some questions coming in here and uh, we can start asking some here with you, Greg. Uh, and just to remind everyone, if you have a question, uh, we can try to get to your question and answer your question in the next 10 minutes or so uh, before the end of this one hour webinar. So yeah, we did get one question asking, how long is today's webinar? Yes, it is a one hour session. We're gonna try to honor your hour here together. So we got some questions coming in, uh, Greg. I think I would start by, I, I believe you covered this, but if you wanted to, um, uh, let us know about is this PLC simulator in particular is it covering a certain brand um, of PLCs ah. and also uh, is it able to be used offline or does it need to be online right yeah good questions um so uh, it is modeled after uh, Alan Bradley uh, as far as the look and feel and the the interface itself uh, this is uh, this is Alan Bradley slick 500. Uh, however, when it comes to when it comes to this kind of programming that we're doing here, uh, move statements, uh, inputs, outputs, uh, it might be called something different. For example, this instruction right here uh, is called an XIC. It's uh, that stands for examine if closed, and that's an Allen Bradley specific term. Uh, somebody else might call it uh, normally open. Uh, however, it works exactly the same way. The, the, how you get this instruction here might be different from one software package or vendor to a front to another. But when you're looking at this, logic is logic and it's gonna run the same and it's gonna execute the same. Yes. Excellent, and thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. 
And um, one of the questions came up on one of the symbols we noticed in, in one of those diagrams. Um, we have the we have the typical input symbol with the two vertical lines there, the two brackets. Uh, and but then there's one that has kind of a slash through it. Um, kind of looks like a normally closed contact <laughs> from a from a, a relay logic diagram. But um, uh, we have a listener asking. Is that also well, what does that stand for? If the ones without the hash through it stands for input, what does that one stand for? Right, right. Uh, when when people are first starting out, this is the one that really messes with them. So I think the easiest way to do it would be to demonstrate this thing here. Uh, so um, this is a not. the The best way to look at this is a not. Alan Bradley calls it an XIO or an examine if open, meaning examine this switch to see if it's open. And if it's open, then this becomes true. So uh, if my best advice to learning about how this works is to forget about schematics, do not look at this like normally open and normally closed because they aren't. These are not, this is not a schematic and that's not a switch. This is, a, this is an instruction. And it's an instruction that I like to I like to think of as not because it says this instruction will become true if this switch is not closed. So let's watch it work one time really quick. Uh, it causes lots of people confusion. I can remember when I was first trying to learn this stuff on my own um, before uh, before the days of uh, Google and. Uh, and, and internet searches and YouTube, uh, this one gave me fits too, because I was an electrician and I understood normally closed and I had to get that out of my head. So here we see the switch is open, but this is, this is true. So this logic that we wrote says, start all these motors when the switch is off. Uh, that might seem a little counterintuitive, but we, probably wouldn't use it with a switch. We would probably use it with an alarm or something like that, right? So here's a here's an alarm contact over here, like a high pressure alarm or something like that, that is normally closed for fail safe reasons. And if our high pressure, pressure switch opens, well, we get a bunch of alarms. That would be more, more than use. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. What else do we have, Ryan? Um, Ryan, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, we have the uh, 555H notation in the MOV line uh, toward the bottom of the program. We had a couple of listeners asking, what does that mean? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the hexadecimal address of, um, of this number right here. This is the hex address. Now, uh, the hexadecimal addressing uh, numbering system, that's something we, we, go, we touch on in the programming class. Uh, it's something that uh, your day-to-day -day user doesn't really need. So we'll talk about it if, it if somebody needs it. We usually talk about it in terms of being able to know what it is, recognize it when you see that. Uh, when we say hexadecimal, all right, see if I just touch on this very, very, very quickly. Um, when, we, when we look at a binary number, it's ones and zeros. When we look at an octal number, uh, it is base eight. Now base eight, what we mean here, decimal like we count, we count from one, we count from zero to nine, then we start over. One zero through one nine, two zero through two nine, that's base 10. And an octal is base eight and hexadecimal is base 16. Uh, it's kind of like shorthand for computers. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, just a different numbering system. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, so definitely we got a lot of curiosity about people um, looking to learn a little bit more about PLCs after this webinar, uh, which is, I think, a, a good course of action. We obviously can't make you experts after one hour of introducing a topic, but hopefully to get this uh, you found this educational now um some folks asking about the plc courses and what's the difference between uh the intro uh, first two-day course versus the second two-day course um so greg if you want to show them where they can go to learn more information 
Um, yeah. We, yeah. They can go to our website, which is live.tpctraining.com um, is really where all the kind of latest info about our courses, when they are, what they are all about and that kind of thing. But to, to give you a little rundown and Greg, you can, uh, you can uh, come in and provide color commentary as well. The first two day course is, is our introduction to PLC for the non-programmer. So basically you don't have to be a computer guy or a programming guy for that matter. Um, and it's really kind of focused on the hardware and the troubleshooting and the different pieces of a PLC. We have some folks at asking about that aspect right now about how often should I charge the battery and, and uh, what are the different working parts of a PLC. That kind of thing is, is what we learn in those first two days and start getting into a little bit of the programming language as well. Inputs, outputs, um, that kind of thing, instructions. But really the second two days, the PLC programming and applications class, that's really what this webinar is highlighting. And that is um, really all about using not only this simulator but our other TPC simulators um, of seeing a more complicated series of, of uh, programming languages, uh, the different, different ladder logic setups and how to troubleshoot them and how to figure out how to create all sorts of different processes happen. Like uh, one person asked, how do I do a pump uh, control uh, on this. That, that's a perfect example of something you can set up in the PLC programming class with the help of the instructor. Um, that kind of thing. Well, anything else you'd like to add about the difference between the first two days and the second two days of a course, Greg? No, I think you, I think you nailed it there, Ryan. The okay. first two days uh, really being uh, what, we, what we concentrate on uh, is uh, it, it's all in terms of troubleshooting. I mean, we, we learn the terminology so that we can speak the language to other maintenance people, engineers, vendors, suppliers, uh, tech support. Uh, and uh, we look at schematics, being able to read uh, schematics that have PLC IO on them, uh, understand how it works. That's a big part of that class, understanding how the PLC works and keeping it simple. What, one of the major things we do when we talk about digital inputs and digital outputs is show clearly that if you can troubleshoot a, a switch and a light, you can troubleshoot a digital input and a digital output. And then throw a little bit of programming in there to get the, the big picture, just a little bit in that class, just so you have the big picture of how the, that mystery box works, that kind of thing, right. And then the programming, uh, I, I think you said it all there too. All right, sounds good. And yeah, definitely uh, call us at this number. Um, myself, Greg, we can be connected with you. We can we can chat with you more about stuff. Um, we've got some really interesting curiosities. And of course, we can, I, I wish we could get to all of them, but um, unfortunately, won't be able to get to all the questions. But I'm going to try to summarize as many as possible in the next just couple minutes here, Greg. First one being, uh, you know, are, are we getting certificates of completion for this webinar? Unfortunately, since this is a free public session, uh, no certificates of completion for this one. But if you do want that official documentation of your training, definitely go to one of our courses where we do provide a full certificate of completion. And that, that could be potentially usable for continuing education for your existing license. You'll want to check in on that as well. Uh, here's an interesting myth. Maybe we can end the session with Greg, and that is, um, if I pulled out the battery of the PLC, would the program be deleted? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's actually a really good question. Uh, the uh, unfortunately, the answer isn't a yes or no. It's it's uh, it's it's the answer that uh, almost always answers every electrical question there is. It depends. <laughs> so it depends. It depends on the processor. Uh, I mean, for for example, um, you know, you could have an Allen Bradley Slick 500 uh, pull the battery out and lose the program. You can have an Allen Bradley Slick 500 and pull the battery out and keep the program, right? The exact same process or just two versions of that. So I, I think, uh, you know, it, it, the simple advice is to uh, check your documentation for that specific processor. Uh, the quick advice is to put changing your batteries in your regular PM schedule. If it's a computer that spits out, uh, you know, PM, chores for you to do once a day, uh, get somebody to add that in there. Typically we change these batteries every year, but the, the real answer to that is check the manufacturer's recommendations. And uh, it, it is, um, let, me, let me end with that, that it is very, very easy to lose a program if your battery is dead 
and you have a power outage. It's gone. I hope you have a backup. Now, that's not true of all processors. Some processors, especially the newer ones, uh, have uh, built, built in redundant backups where you have uh, maybe it's a compact flash card in there and uh, you, your battery's dead and you lose power and the program goes away in the memory of the processor. But then when it boots back up, it automatically loads, loads it from that compact flash card back into the memory and you're ready to roll again. Uh, some of them are like that. But many, many people have lost their program and had to rewrite it with lots of downtime simply because they didn't take that few minutes to change the battery every, uh, every year. And you have to, you have, sometimes you have to have the power on to change the battery. Sometimes you have to have the power off to change the battery, depending on your specific processor. You know, Absolutely. Great, great question. Yeah, definitely great questions here. And, and we got a lot of applied, very uh, specific to your application type of questions about, you know, having different start and stop buttons in process with different pumps and different situations. And kind of to close out, I would say, bring those applied issues to your instructor during your next class that you can get on online or in a place near you and ask those questions. You'll, you'll have two full days to, to really pick the brain of that instructor. Bring the program with you um, on your laptop or, or print it out or whatever you want to do. And you can talk about it in detail with the instructor. We love doing that, right, Greg? <laughs> yes, so, we, um, we do. We do. We love solving problems. Yeah, definitely. So, so that's really what these courses are all about is using your own applied situation. And that downtime issue really becomes the, the biggest driver here, right? We want to reduce the amount of time you spend troubleshooting PLCs and have more time where you can actually be running the system with the PLCs. So thank you, Greg, so much for presenting for us today. And thank you all for being here. Have a great day.